Hi everyone, nice to see you all again. Um, welcome to week three. Uh, I hope you've had an okay time so far in the course. I can see we've got 34 people in the lecture at the moment. Um, so far everyone seemed pretty calm, uh, pretty relaxed, just working through assignment one. Um, I have been recording and uploading my tutorials, by the way, for those of you who watch them. I got asked this really good question the other day that I do just want to quickly repeat though for everyone, which is, um, you know, someone said, is this what we do in industry? They were like, uh, do we, do we essentially just sit down and make pixels perfect to looking at JPEGs or PNGs or something? And, uh, the end, you know, it's a great question. The answer I gave is kind of like, no, um, generally speaking, you'd find that, you know, front end development is broken up into really a few key layers of the stack. Um, the first layer is the actual UI elements, really like the CSS is kind of the simplest way of explaining that. Then as you go further down, you're dealing more with the JavaScript and the logic layer. And that logic layer often could be totally separated from a front end. It, it might not have a ton to do with how it's rendered or how it looks. It might just have to do with, you know, the functionality, the behavior. Um, so getting the UI right is a component of the technical part of front end development. Typically how you'll do that in a really nice industry is that you'll be given essentially the equivalent of like a Photoshop file or something that actually has all the layers and everything else separated out, um, you know, for you. So that'd be nice and elegant. Um, though in some cases you will end up with pretty rudimentary designs or you'll end up with having to fill in a gap. The point of exercise, the point of assignment one is to help you uh, f have a more fine-tuned understanding of CSS because, you know, even though like maybe it's not literally what you would do every day, being able to kind of intuitively be like, mm, okay, that's about 10 pixels. I understand what happens if I change this, if I move the padding and I move this, you know what I mean? Like we could give you an assignment that was just, here is all of the elements and all of the styles and now you just have to go and insert that into HTML tags, but you're not gonna actually get a, a feel for anything down that down that kind of path. Anyway, on to today. The the only other update, a couple of updates I had to share with you all today is that assignment 2 has been released. So we have released assignment 2. It's been pushed to your repository. You should be able to access it from the homepage of GitLab. Uh, we're not going to be talking about it until next Wednesday. So next Wednesday we will talk about assignment two. The lecture next week is pretty much just devoted to assignment two. Um, also, as a reminder, please keep an eye out on GitLab for um, potential merge requests. So what happens, this is just like a little friendly reminder, is that sometimes when we make updates to things, such as assignment one, what you might see sometimes, why doesn't this expand? Oh. How do I get this to expand? I never know why that expands or doesn't expand. That's so weird. Oh, down here. <laughs> Some of you know that and I just look like an idiot. Um, so in terms of this, it's like one thing to keep an eye on on your repositories, in particular your assignment repositories, is this merge request thing on the left hand side here. Because what we do is if we, um, uh, if we have like extra changes to make, what we actually do is we actually push it to your repository. We actually push like an update to your repository. Um, so if that thing says not zero, you have to click on that and merge it in manually. If you need help with that, just post on the forum. We're super happy to help. Um, but you'll often see changelog stuff appear quite regular, not regularly. Honestly, it's been pretty easy this term. Um, you'll sometimes see changelog stuff appear like this. So the last change we made was a week ago. Um, and it's, they're all quite minor. When I say change, it's, it's often more a clarification log. But let's get into the fun stuff. What we're gonna be talking through today is a very, it's a very practical demo. So the first couple of weeks were very theoretical. Today, we're gonna be focusing on building web pages with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So week one, we talked about the history of the web. Week two, we talked about how JavaScript ecosystem works. By now, because you've watched the week one, two, and three lectures, we believe that you have the skills necessary now to go 
and to actually build a, a web page with HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and these interactive components. So you can go watch this YouTube link. It's a great link. All we're doing today is we're going to try and solve this problem. Uh, if we have extra time, then we can always look at a React version of it, though, to be honest, I don't think we ever really do. Um, though this is our task for today. We're going to build a web page. We're going to build a web page that says, please invite your friends to join CSE at the top of the page. It's going to have a text area with a welcome message that you can enter. On the blur of that welcome message, and when you click off it, if the field's empty, the color of that text area's background goes to red. You're gonna have two inputs for email addresses with an add more button at the end where every time you click it, it doubles, the, it, it increases the number of fields by two. So it goes two, four, six, eight, ten, 10, up till 10, but no more. Um, and then we're going to have a submit button that when you click it, it gives you a summary screen, uh, like a pop-up before allowing the user to cancel or continue. We're going to do all this with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Again, I don't think we're going to take two hours. I know I say that, <laughs> and we, we tend to. Um, but why are we doing this today? We're doing this today to tie in a bunch of topics that have so far been like, here's the events lecture, here's the DOM lecture, here's the forms lecture, you know, here's the mobile lecture, all these little things. Um, and we're also doing it because this, these are some fundamental concepts that you will find pivotal for your assignment too. Because your assignment too is just kind of this, but at a much bigger scale and including a whole bunch of networking stuff, which we talk about next week. So the only difference between like next week, we're going to do some demos, which are going to be like this week, except next week we have a lot more to do with networks and marketing and asynchronicity and stuff, marketing, um, networks and I didn't mean to say marketing. I have no idea what I meant. Networks and um, networks. There you go. Not marketing. Okay, so let's dig into it today. We're gonna we're gonna start this all from scratch today. Um, I'm gonna go and make a new file here. I'll just make it inside a CS6080. Um, in fact, I might make it inside the lecture notes so we can so we can push that up. Because um, sometimes we have folders here, like you can see I've got a folder here, week 9, 20 T1. So I might make a folder here uh, called um, week 3, 21 T3, and I'll push this at the end of the lecture. Uh, I have to close my Sublime editor and reopen it again. To, it's very complicated why this has to happen, but um, it has to happen. Okay. Great. So CS6080 content, lecture notes, week three, 21 T3, great. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go make a couple of files. Now for this one, I'm gonna keep it relatively simple and I'm just gonna have an index.html file, which is kind of what your assignment two is gonna have. It's just gonna have one HTML file. And then I'm gonna create a JavaScript file where we'll do all the JavaScript. What we'll do in this lecture is we'll keep all the CSS in line up the top, though if this was an actual assignment, you would either at sometime or at the end or at the start, you would move it into its own external style sheet. Okay, so I'm gonna, like, give me a second to make a, make a couple of files here for you. So I'm just going to get this set up really quick. How's everyone's week, by the way? Are you all, are you all happy? Are you all well? Um, Forty people here. Hope you're all happy and well, and life's going okay wherever you are. You know, it's terrible. It's not good. That sucks. Sorry to hear that. Um, on the plus side, summer's coming soon. Daylight savings next week, which means we all get to do our hour of exercise later in the day. Actually, I have a question for you. I've actually been. This is unrelated. The thing I can never get my head around um, is students don't post on the forum during the day. Um, like, it's just literally like quiet till like 5 p.m. and then it goes crazy in the evening. And I know some of you work, but not all of you work. And I'm just like, what are you all doing during the day? Like, because I assume you sit down in the evening and you write assignments, but like, is it just during the day you're just like, you're doing fun fun life things during the day and then, you, then you're working on boring uni stuff in the evening? Is that what happens? Or is everyone's just sleeping in until 1 p.m. and then you gotta make breakfast and figure everything out? Um, sleep, 
Okay, everyone's just saying they're sleeping. Cool, I was just curious. I'm always like wondering what you're all up to. Um, cool, all right, let's get stuck into it. So I've got I've got two files here. Um, I've got run.js and index.js and HTML. I know that the, oh, other quick update. Very exciting. I'm getting NBN next week. <laughs> so we get to stream at a high bit rate. Isn't that exciting? So this will be the last lecture where you can't see text very clearly. Um, I'm I'm pumped. So, um, oh yeah, labs and shoots. I forget all the labs and shoots and stuff. Okay. So, yeah, what internet am I on at the moment? Um, I'm on a 4G connection that has a maximum upload speed of uh, 250 kilobytes a second. Um, which I have to say, I am extremely impressed at the quality um, of this, this upload stream get at 250 kilobytes a second. It's like substantially better than I thought it would be. Let's sorry, I'm 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 talking about really boring things now. So um, let's open up this page and let's start building it because that's what we're really doing. Okay, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna pull it up. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to, like, whenever you build a web page, I generally recommend that you start with trying to, um, uh, you know, how would you put it? Start trying to build out the basic HTML elements first. Then I think it's good to try and dig a little bit more into the JavaScript and then CSS sometimes at the end. Um, you know, but that's really up to you. That's just kind of my advice generally as what to do. Um, all right, let's open up index.html. This is our empty file. Great. Okay, now let's look at the lecture notes. So let's copy and paste this straight in. We can just put it in as a comment so we can see it for a little bit. Okay, well, what are the key elements here? It says, please invite your friends to join at the top. Let's just make that a small header. Please invite your friends to join CSE up the top. Has a text area with a welcome message. Maybe we can preface that with, you know, welcome message. Then we'll put a text area here. Um, okay, on blur, if the field is empty, you know, color it red or something. Um, okay, let's just leave this as a comment here for that. Great, um, has a text area, has two inputs for email address, all right. Um, because we have multiple things, sometimes it's good to, um, uh, you know, sometimes it's good to wrap them in a block. So I'm just gonna make an empty div here. And then inside of that empty div, I'm going to start putting in two inputs. So we'll put two, two uh, type equals email inputs. This can be type equals text as well. Um, the way forms work on browsers is that the, in the last years, there's been, a, there's been an expansion of the, the types you can use for a form input. So you can do things now like, I think, mobile number, number, email. And what that means is that's an instruction to a browser who's interpreting your HTML. Um, and it's like, oh, you want an email, I'll, I'll do the validation check. So the browser will do it for you. And it also does things like allows the browser to um, make suggestions as to what uh, to put in. So have you ever noticed if you're on your phone and you're on a website and it prompts you for your email and you tap on the field, the web browser actually tells you, do you want to enter your, like it, it gives you a couple of email suggestions from previous emails you've entered. Um, that's, that's, why this, that's why you might have a type email here. Older browsers that don't have that implementation will simply default to a text field. Um, that's also why if you see particular form inputs on the web on websites and you click on them and you get the numpad, that's because they've used a number type. So in this case, we're gonna use an email type. Great, um, and add more button at the end. Okay, uh, let's just do a button add more. Cool, um, yeah, populates more fields until you reach 10 addresses. Let's add this here too. This is just how I'm approaching the page, right? I'm just breaking down requirements. Uh, we have a submit button that when clicked provides a summary section before allowing the user to, okay. Um, button submit. Okay, let's see how this looks. All right, pretty simple. What are some obvious things? If you were designing this page, if you were, if you were implementing this, what, what are some things that you would possibly change already before you even start worrying about the JavaScript or anything?
Add labels. Yeah. Labels would be useful, definitely. Put in some BRs. Yeah. Uh, generally speaking, you should try and avoid the use of line breaks, BR tags, because it's it's uh, it's hard to explain. It's like with BR tags, the you know it creates a line, sure, but you should try and do that with margins or something because, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't even know how to articulate that. It's it's um. If you're putting a BR tag there somewhere, it's typically because something needs more space above it or something needs more space below it. In which case, put a margin there, you know, because a particular element might might want that space. Okay, so there's a few, there's a bunch of ideas here. So, I mean, firstly, let's make this a proper HTML page, right? Um, you know, let's give it a head, let's give it a title of um, invite friends, uh, end the head, body. We'll put all this stuff inside the body, easy. I might actually change the tab space to two spaces just so it's like we have a little bit more compactness here today. Um, and then end HTML and then there you go. Oh, I have so many great, so many great things people have suggested. Um, let's go through some of them though. Uh, Jehenzeb says the ugliness needs to be fixed. That's true, not the most helpful, but it is true. I'll give you that. Um, maybe not Wilhelm says add placeholders to make it clear what goes in. Yeah, that's a good point. So it's like generally one thing that's always good to add to your form elements is like placeholder text because placeholder text will appear. Again, this is an example of this is an instruction to the browser. It tells the browser what to do. And in this case, what it's telling the browser to do um, is to put this text here until you click on it and override it. You know, so that's all that is. Now, here's the thing. This is the cool thing about Webrite is that 15 years ago, to do this, you actually had to do it manually with JavaScript. You actually had to like put the text in and, and watch the events and change the style. And then then browser people are just like, hey, um, browser, browser people, people who like write standards for the web are like, hey, everyone's doing this. Why don't we just build this into the standard and then ask browser designers to implement it? So now we have placeholder. That wasn't there when I started web development. Neither was type email. So it's really cool how this whole field is just kind of always advancing forward. And naturally it's led pretty heavily by, you know, the browser makers, which is in a large part Google, realistically. Um, okay, so some people have said, uh, let's make a style as well. So we got our style type equals text CSS and style. And let's add a, a couple of things. Let's put, let's put some styles on body. Let's give it a, a more friendly font font family, okay? Let's maybe text align center the whole page. Don't know how this will look. Okay, that looks weird, but it's still a little bit better. Um, yeah, title browser people. Um, Dylan said class and ID names. That's true though. I wouldn't worry too much uh, until you actually start putting classes and IDs on things. I don't think everything needs an ID just because it exists, but that's definitely the right way to think. Um, CC says display block or add text headings to make it clear what the form inputs are looking for from the user. Yeah, so what we might do here, for instance, is say email one, and then here we'll say email two. Now remember that HTML ignores white space. So this is gonna create a weird thing where it's just not gonna look right. Okay, so what can we do here? Well, simple one, um, we could wrap it in a div to start. That's one possibility, so I could just like start here, wrap this in a div, wrap this in a div, and then I'll start giving them a class name. Okay, so in this case, we're doing the style first. So let's give it a class name of say, um, uh, email box. And that one will like, just because it's a div, that's gonna fix some stuff up for us already. Um, though, oh, email box, sorry, I need to do the style right there. Generally CSS is um, dashes separating things. Okay, so that's looking a little bit better. You probably want to give these things a bit of space. So let's give it, you know, 10 pixels on the top and zero pixels at the bottom. Uh, sorry, 10 pixels at the top and bottom, zero pixels on the left and right. All right, well, you know, this looks this looks better already. And maybe that add more and submit button could perhaps be, um, you know, separate. So maybe we'll wrap that in. When I say separate, I mean on different lines. Um, 
padding. Yeah, so I won't get too much into the layout. I mean, most of the things you've all said about the layout are pretty good. Um, you know, though... Oh, that's not good. So here's the thing. You might be tempted to be like, oh, I should put a BR here. And you're like, yay, that looks good now. But BRs are so rigid. Like, it's that exact size. Like, you're much better off saying something like, you know... Um, uh, button button area you call this button area or something and then you just give this a class such as button area and you know you give that for instance you know again another 10 pixels zero and you know, there we go now it looks a bit weird but let's let's just start there we're poking it a little bit too much um so cc's pointed out do we need a form tag um okay so HTML forms are funny little things. The original intention of HTML forms, originally, was that you would have a form tag like this. You would have a series of inputs like this. And then somewhere in there, you'd have an input type equals submit. And when someone clicks that submit, what it would do is it would, it would go and get all of the form elements, it would get all the form elements, and it would, it would uh, basically refresh your page except send the data as a certain get request, like an HTTP post get put delete request, to a particular page. So it was kind of a way for you to say, I'm on this page, I wanna now go, I wanna go to that page and I'm gonna send it that data while I go to it. And that data is gonna come from all the inputs in the form. That was kind of like the classic form model um, and if you didn't have the form attribute, the submit button wouldn't do anything because the submit button doesn't know where to go, it doesn't know what method, it doesn't know what inputs to include because the submit button submits all of the inputs inside of it. Um, since the introduction of like more aggressive JavaScript heavy pages, the, the necessity for the structure of the form element is, is a lot less critical. It's probably still worthwhile to do in some cases. Though the thing is, because you're not actually using the submit button a lot of the time, and because you're not actually using the browser's ability to send the inputs to a particular web page, um, nothing bad will happen if you don't do that. Because nowadays, form inputs are used less as part of a, a grouped form, and they're used more as just the visual you know, aids that actually give you these elements like text areas and stuff. So should you include that? I don't know if it's vital to include it. It probably depends. I think I think at the very least, sometimes it's good to just, um, you know, like uh, even just visually, it can help. Even if you just use a tag like this, which is totally redundant. Well, not totally redundant. It just doesn't achieve a lot. So um, that's kind of useful. I'd, I'd probably say at the very least, do that um, to start. Because you can definitely dig deeper. Okay, so one thing that was mentioned by people is definitely form labels. Um, I think that's the only thing we didn't quite tackle. So with forms, it's always really good to use a label such as like if I put um, label equals label four equals email one like this, and I wrap this into a label. What a label does is a label is like a, it's like an accessibility element. Um, whereby if you click on that label, it will highlight the form input for you. And you do this all the time probably without realizing. So if I put this label here, nothing happens differently on the page. And when I click on it, nothing interesting happens. But that's because the label, it will highlight for you a particular element, which I think is, I think it's by ID or it's by name. I can't remember. It's by ID. So notice here when I click on email one, it highlights the field for me. This is actually most useful for checkboxes. So if I say have a checkbox here, um, you again would do this one without realizing all the time as you would, you would sometimes just click on that. Or you might in some cases, you know, actually put the whole label wrapped around it like this. So that anytime you click in the area, it actually highlights it for you. And again, you might not think this is a big deal, but if you turn this off, you tend to notice it pretty quickly or you notice web pages where it is off for. So we can do this for, say, both, um, let's turn this back to email type. We can do this for both labels here, email one, email two, like that, easy done. 
I probably want to... Oopsie daisy. Yep. There you go, my two emails, email address one, email address two. And we could do the same thing for welcome message, but you get the point, right? So, oh, great. Um, yeah, it's, uh, yes, definitely. So, okay, we've done the, we've done the basic elements, great. Um, now let's have a look at what the JavaScript we want to do is here. So, Where's your JavaScript going to go? Right at the bottom of the page. In fact, let's just include our JavaScript. Script type equals text slash JavaScript. Um, oh, and then source equals run.js. That's the name of the file. Uh, yeah, so George has, George has pointed out an important thing too, which is that you only need this label for if, if it's, um, uh, if, the input's not inside of the label itself, which can happen sometimes as well. Uh, most of these things you can figure out pretty quickly through trial and error too. So I'm including my run.js here. Now, this particular web page we're building today is a little bit similar to assignment two in the sense that, um, in the sense that we are actually writing HTML elements on this page. Um, in some lab activities, we actually ask that you construct everything from scratch with JavaScript. And in fact, the tutorial three or the tutorial three recording this week, we do a little bit of that. We generate some elements with um, uh, JavaScript and we'll do a bit of that tonight. For your assignment too, you can actually, you can actually write things out um, you can actually write things out in the HTML and then just reuse them or clone them. Um, and we might maybe try and do that today. Maybe that'll be a good little demonstration. Uh, Lil, Lil Nako says, um, uh, with regards to JavaScript import, I read it's more efficient to put the import in the head with the defer attribute. This way the JavaScript loads in the background and is ready by the time the HTML renders. I mean, I know what you're talking about. Um, I can't remember the, the, the specific behavior. Okay, the brow it tells the browser not to wait for the script. So it defers a new attribute that was added to the script tag, um, which again, basically, um, where does it describe it? The defer attribute tells the browser not to wait for the script. Instead, the browser will continue to process the HTML, build the DOM, the script loads in the background, and then only runs once the DOM is fully built. Uh, yeah, so I mean for my very limited understanding in this putting this in your like what defer helps you do is it helps you put the JavaScript essentially anywhere um, Without having a penalty because normally what happens is if you put it above or up the top Sometimes the browser will block DOM rendering until it's loaded and JavaScript files can be really heavy these days They can have a lot of text in them. So um, You know Often we want to put the JavaScript at the end. We want it to load at the end. Um, it, we, uh, let me be specific. We want it to not block anything. We want the page to do its first full render without blocking anything. Um, you can read into this if you want though, generally speaking, um, it's kind of much of a muchness. Just don't, don't, you know, you can use defer and up the top and read into this a bit more. You can just put it at the bottom. Okay, let's let's do a couple things. Run.js. So, one of the first things here is that on blur, if the field is empty, the color of the background goes red. Okay, well, let's give this an ID. We'll call this welcome message. Great. Now in our JavaScript, we can start doing some things like say we can go and uh, capture that welcome message DOM element by getting its element by ID like this. So now what this will mean is that um, this particular variable here refers to that DOM element. And if I was to say, just print that, and remember this code will just get run at the end of the page. So we might have to open uh, this here. Save, refresh, there's the text area, right? What do I want to do? I want it to change color on blur. So I can make it change color now just by doing style.background color. I could specify red and that'll just make it red straight away because 
This is just running when the page loads. It's just, you know, welcome message is that. Um, it's style background colors red, but I instead want to do that on a particular event. So the event I want to listen to, right, is welcome message. I want to add a listener to that event that's listening to the blur event. And what it's going to do is this is going to take in a function. I'll call it fn. And that function fn, which always takes in an event, is going to do something like, say, blurred, like that. Click on it, I click off it, I get blurred. I click on it, I click off it, I get blurred. However, what's generally better JavaScript syntax is to instead of doing this, is you actually just go and take the whole function and you just go and plop it in here, like that. You know, because uh, at least, uh, does that even work these days? Yeah, that works fine. Um, however, again, we'd like to use more modern syntax, which is to actually forget the function fn. And the more modern syntax is to replace function fn with just const fn equals event equals arrow and then uh, console log blurred. And the added benefit of this syntax is that when you use this function anonymously, you don't need to give it the const fn. You can just take that and dump it there like this. Done. Easy, right? Um, now this works fine. I get blurred, I get blurred, I get blurred. And then we can take our welcome message dot background color and then put that in there instead so that when we click off it, it's red. Okay. So what was the original uh, specification for us here? The original specification was on blur, if the field is empty, color the background red until it's valid, right? Okay, well, um, how do we tell if it's valid, if the field's empty? All right, well, how do we do that? Well, we need to check if the field is empty. How do we check if the field is empty? Well, let's console log welcome message. Let's just see what the elements are. How do I get the like properties? I can't remember even how to get properties, but there's a particular property of welcome message, and this is true for all HTML elements, called uh, inner, there's two things here, there's inner HTML and inner text. Inner HTML will get you all of the inside nested HTML elements, though um, that's not always handy or useful. Generally, if you know your HTML, ele HTML element just contains text, like a text area or a P tag, then you can use inner text, and this will actually print you the, the stuff inside of it, uh, or not in this case. I've probably forgotten the right, or is oh, a text elements the weird one? Ah, oh, text elements are so weird. So, <laughs> sorry, text areas are weird. So a normal HTML tag, right? Like say this one, let's just call this invite heading. If you want to get the text inside that tag, you could do that pretty easily. You could say document dot get element by ID dot in a text console log it right there you go there's the inner text for text areas and I forget this all the time because text areas are treated like a form element even though they have an open and close tag which makes them different from the other inputs for consistency to get the inner the inner text out of a text area you use the dot value command, which is the same thing you would typically use on a form input as well. So in this case here, that's why it's dot value instead of inner text, because it's a text area, which is a form element. So I type stuff, I click off it. Now, if I want it to only go red when it's empty, I just say, if it's empty, make it red. Great. So I click on it, I write stuff, I click off it. Still red because I didn't write the condition right, sorry. It's my fault. Click on it, I type, I click off it, I click on it, I type, I click off it, I click on it, I delete it, I click off it, it's red. But I wanted to go back to white now as soon as I type something, not after I click off. In fact, we didn't even have a check to make it not red anymore. So obviously you could get around this by, you could say, you know, well, if it's empty, then make it red. And if it's not empty, then, you know, make it none. So I type, I click off empty, I click off, I type, I click off. I've probably got that wrong. Background color. What should the background color be? Default. I 
I'm doing something wrong. Uh, what is it? Background color. So like, this is like normal, you know, I, I like we, we do this stuff in lectures because again, it's, there's some kind of pro like you could do white, but the problem is white sounds all good, but that's only because your background's white. You don't want your, like you want your, you want the background to be gone. Oh, initial. Yeah, so I, I could make it white just to be clear, but it's just like the second then someone comes along and like changes another parent element, like it's only white. You, you get my point, right? It's only white because that's just what it is right now. But you actually want to get rid of it. That's what you want. So, I mean, let's try initial. I just read the CSS docs and it said there's like transparent, initial, inherit. Okay, sure, initial. That's the initial property it was. Nice and easy. Transparent's also fine. Um, in this case, I imagine, I, I probably initial's better because you know, you don't know what the initial background was. Um, in this case, the initial is transparent. Okay, so this is all good, but you don't want it to happen when the, like you don't want it to happen on blur. You want the red background to go away the second someone starts typing, right? You don't want the red background to appear as soon as as soon as like they've started typing because like you want to give them a chance to get it right. You know, so a really common method with you know form inputs is to only to only trigger an error or an error signal when you click off it because while people are typing, like I literally booked a Jetstar flight like thirty minutes before this this thing, and it asked me for the date of birth, and it was like you know. It was like, you know, month, year, month, uh, day, month, year. And I typed in, you know, a day here. And then I typed in a month here. And as soon as I typed in the month, I got an error on this particular element that was like, oh, you didn't enter it. And I'm like, I know I didn't enter it. I'm not done yet. So the blur is really useful here because you only want to really like check if you think they're done. And they tend to be done when they click off it. Okay, so what we're going to do for the... Um, uh, getting rid of the red is we're actually going to use a different event listener. Right, we'll use um, change. And let's try this one out and let's just, let's just play, oh, I've, I'm missing a bracket somewhere. Oh no, just a comma. Let's actually just play around with this and see when it appears. So if I click on it, if I click off it, okay, I don't get the on change event. If I type, if I click off it, okay, on change is the same thing. So that's not quite what I want because I actually want to do it every key press. So you can see on change and on blur have a very similar kind of behavior. Um, I actually want to do it on say key up. Okay, that's good. Great. Seems to work fine. So now I'm going to check it like before. I'm going to say, you know what? If on key up, if the value is not blank, we want to set the background color to the initial. Done. Perfect. And let's get rid of this silly check too. So now it's blank. I type. Goes away. Should I use key up or key down? Give me your reasoning. Someone in the chat, share with me your rationale on which I should use. Really tired today. You all tired? I'm tired. Maybe it's the rain. It's going to rain for a few days in Sydney. Oh yeah, I mean, just while people are answering, so my MBN I think will be HFC, but I, I tell you, it's going to be so much better than this thing I have <laughs> at the moment. Um, and someone, what was it someone said before? They were like, um, something about, does the uni pay for the 4G connection? No, the uni doesn't pay for the 4G connection. <laughs> the uni would not pay casual staff much. I mean... Someone in the school might be nice enough to, you know, pay for a microphone if I ask them for it, but, um, you know, unis aren't full of money. Um, okay, so we've got some answers. Key down so it looks more responsive. Key down feels more responsive. When you press the key or release the key, it depends what you want to do. Yes, that's true. I'm interested in this case. Should key up mean you stop typing so key up is better? Okay, so key up is when you're, um, uh, when your, your finger comes off, off the key. 
key downs feel more responsive and in general i think key downs are probably like key down is like when you press key up is when you take it off so key ups will feel less responsive key downs will have this like real feel to them the reason you'd probably want to use a key up though is um if if you think someone might hold down a key or if the check is kind of negative like you tend to do positive checks i think on key up, key down and negative checks on key up um because you know you just don't know like i'll give you an example um you know let's say you have some text like this a b c d e f g and it says sorry your your text in input can only be five elements um a key up can be more efficient if say someone clicks and holds down delete because to delete those eight keys there was only one key up whereas the key down was at the start so if the key down was at the start and, and I hold it down, it, it's only going to get the information at the beginning state, which will have too many elements. So it's really, you know, it's really depends on the circumstance you're using. Generally, I think key down is more likely to be the case. So you can easily play with them, right? Like in this case here, it's like, okay, key, key up works fine. It just feels a bit, you know, like A is fine. It just felt a bit slow, right? But here's the other thing. What happens when I hold down a key? It's still red until I let go, right? We don't really want that. Whereas say key down, red it goes the second I type something Oops, the second I type something it goes away um, oh okay so Raymond says what are positive and negative checks that's a phrase I just made up to be perfectly honest what, I, what I'm referring to there is like um, generally when I say positive check I mean checking if they've done the right thing like like rewarding them for doing the right thing and negative check is like punishing them for doing the wrong thing because like I, I, this is just a very general rule here it's like um th this is not like a bible rule or anything it's like uh, if someone does something um if you're checking if they've done something wrong generally it's a good idea to wait until they've done every till they've they've finished the action they're doing you know that's the key up whereas if you want to say oh you've done the right thing um like you know take away an error or give them a success message su success message generally doing it on key down could be very useful so great we got our red box really simple perfect um done it's uh it's 654 um i'll answer raymond's question then we'll take a break and keep going um so raymond says so like verification would most likely be a negative check yeah i mean i I'm worried about these like terms I just made up, but um, yeah, like it it's like all kinds of checks are did they do a good job or or bad job? But the question is, what are you going to do with that information, right? So in this case here, we in some case, if they didn't do the right job, we're gonna make something red and say bad, 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 and if they if they do the right thing, we say like good, good, good. So um, most again, it's. I wouldn't get caught up on rules around this because most of it's really intuitive. And if you if you just try both, you can very quickly figure out which one makes more sense. Um, because, you know, some some will just be like, oh, that's obvious, it should be key up. And others will be like, oh, it should be key down uh, just by playing around with it. So play around with it's the short answer. Let's take a five to eight minute break. I don't know, seven, a few minutes past seven, we'll keep going um, and finish off this page. Uh, where were we? We were we were trying to finish the JavaScript part of this. We'd already gone through, you know, kind of some of the harder things. Uh, well, the easier things. Now we're going to tackle two slightly harder things, which are the populating more fields part. Now, I like this one because it really, it really helps demonstrate adding more DOM elements. So, like what I'll say, what I'll say here is that we have uh, these elements here and i'm gonna to have to leave the ids on them for now but let's say we want to add more okay when you click this button we want to add more so what i'm probably going to do first is i'm going to say uh, add more email fields button or something like this so that then in my javascript i can capture that um add more email fields i can capture this particular element um, like that and then i can say listen for a click Add event listener click and then I'll have my event function you know I'm, I'm just writing standard code here I haven't had to, I had to I haven't had to solve a problem yet click 
And I like solving problems like this. I like just doing, we know how to do all this. We add that, we do this, we refresh the page, we, we... Oh, what's happening? What is happening here? Does anyone know? When I click this, it seems to appear then disappear. Like, I know why it's happening, but like, do you know why it's happening? That's not good. Help me out. Figure out what's wrong. So mysterious. Prevent default. Okay, so what's actually happening here is that when you have a form tag on your page, any submit button or button that you click that, you know, doesn't have more information on it will automatically submit the form. And if you submit a form where there's no action, like we had before, which is where you send the data, it will just refresh the page and send the data to that page. And in fact, you can actually see it at the end of the URL. You probably can't see it on the stream because of the bad quality, but there's actually a question mark at the end of the URL there. And that's actually all of the form input data that's been uh, sent, I believe. So you, we might even be able to see that more if I even give one of these form fields a name, like input to, and I click add more. And we look at the URL. You can actually see that in the URL, I'll put this in the text editor so it's bigger. The URLs actually put email to at the end. So it's actually submitted the form in like the old school, late nineties form submission style of HTML. Now that's not what we want here. Okay. How do we stop that? Well, there's a few things we can do. One is we could get rid of the form element completely. That would be one. Um, like if we just got rid of it, I think that actually solves the problem. Um, that solves the problem, but let's say you want to keep it in. I think you might even be able to set the action as a hash. That's another way to solve it. So w whenever you link to a URL that begins with hash, it actually doesn't reload the page. It actually just starts putting hashes at the end of the URL. Um, it's a bit of a weird behavior, but um, I mean, probably don't do that one. That one's just a bit awkward. The other thing you can do is that before you submit, you will actually notice that this function gets called. The click appears, let me put the form back. It is back. Why is it not refreshing? I'm very confused. Why is that not? Oh, there's, a, there's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's already a hash at the end of the page. Hashes, hashes are weird. You can play around them if you want. Like, I think what's happening here is because the hash is at the end of the page, it's trying to load the same URL, which has a hash. So it's not actually reloading. the. I think that's it. That's probably going to be it. So yeah, there's the weird behavior. Notice the click appears first. So this is useful because it tells us that we're actually getting inside of our event listener first. So some people have mentioned that you can call a command, which is prevent default. So what prevent default does when you click it, if you call it on the event attribute that's passed in like this, what it does is it actually stops the event, like it stops the normal event process from bubbling up. Because when you click on this button, calling the event listener is just one of the things that it does by default, right? What else does it do by default? Depends on what the button is, depends on what it's doing. But if you call the event.preventDefault, that kind of stops the normal behavior. This can be useful in other contexts too, but like for right now, it stops it submitting the form. So that's great. So now what we want to do is when we click that, we want two more emails to appear. So think about programming now from the top down. Let's just write a function to do it for us. So we could say create uh, email field, right? And let's just call this twice. And let's make a function up here called const create email field and it's going to take nothing in and what it's going to do is it's going to say console log adding email field. Now again, I'm, I'm just showing you how you can break these problems down into pieces at a time. I click that so now we know we're adding two email fields. Well, how do we actually add an email field? That's hard. Let's try creating a DOM element. A really simple one. Let's just make a div. 
Uh, we'll call it dummy and we'll say document uh, dot create element. We'll create a div and we'll set dummy's inner text to be dummy. And then we, we got to push it somewhere. We want to append it to something. Now, again, there's an assumption if you're watching this lecture that you've watched the material of lectures in week three and you've gone to your tutorial in week three. So I, I'm, I'm not skipping over things here. I'm kind of just not reteaching things we should have already taught. Um, this is creating an HTML element. So maybe I'll just quickly remind you of this. If I console log that, you'll see that it's actually an HTML element that's being created. So we've created two divs. We've set the inner text to, to be dummy. There's some funny things about the ordering of that console log, but we've created two divs here. And now when we want to add that div or those divs to a particular element, we can use a pen child. So where do we want to add it? We want to add it to our email box list. So I've got this div ID here for email box list, which is our like kind of email. So I'm now going to get that element by ID. Maybe I'll just say here document dot get element by ID dot append child. And we're just going to append our dummy to it. Great, cool. Okay, so this works. Now, you know what? Let's actually approach this problem backwards. Rather than trying to get it working correctly, let's actually cap the number of elements because remember how it said you can't push more than 10. So now let's actually create a counter. We'll call it const, um, or we'll call it let email field count equals two. And what we'll say is at the end of this function, right, we will increase email field count by two. And before, before we actually create it, we might then say, um, you know, if email field count is less than nine or less than equal to eight. Well, actually we should probably do this we should probably do this in this function, realistically. Um, you know, so there's your create email field. If email field counts less than eight, do it and then increase it by two. So now we should only get dummy appear in pairs four times. One, two, three, four, nothing, great. And you know what's even better? Maybe let's remove the add more button. That'd be clearer because nothing's worse than a button that does nothing. Obviously you could give it a pop-up, like, you know, you could say, you know, else alert, no. But you know, that, that could be confusing. One, two, three, four. No. Okay, that's not good. Um, so let's actually make the button disappear. So, you know, if it's if it's greater than eight, you know, why don't we just, um, okay, document dot get element by ID, add, actually I've already, I've already got the button. Right, um, dot, let's just hide it. Style dot display equals uh, none. I think that's hiding. Well, the the tags that yeah, it's 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 the tags valid. It's just not there anymore. So you'll see if we inspect this, the tag the button is here. When I click it four times, it's still there. It's just now hidden. You see though that um, the problem here naturally being that what happened is I had to click it an extra time. So we kind of probably actually want to put the check in here and say, you know, if email field count is greater or equal to 10, then, you know, we'll, we'll make it hide away. And that's probably, you know, the better logic here. And we'll, we'll see that when we go, you know, click, 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 click. Um, so Lil Nacko's pointed out child nodes dot length. Let's come back and refactor that to be a bit clearer. But now I've got this behavior. Now I want to create more email fields, but how do I do that? Well, I could construct it. I could construct a div email box, I could construct a label, then I could construct an input and then set all of those input parameters. And it's like, that's a lot of code to write. Or this is quite useful for your second assignment. I could create a template. So what I'm going to do is just down here at the bottom of the page, doesn't matter where, I'm going to create a object called, you know, class equals email box. I'm going to leave the label out. I'm going to leave the name and ID out and I'm just going to keep it simple. It will be hidden down here, but here's the thing, because this is a template that I want to use to like copy and paste, right? I'm trying to copy and paste this box. I will now set the style to be display none because I want it to be hidden. So no one else can see it but me. No one else knows it's here except me, right? Should be pretty simple. And now we're going to try and copy and paste that, but I've forgotten how to copy and paste it. So I'll, you know, HTML DOM copy tag, copy element. Clone node. Okay, well, this sounds like what I'm looking for, right? I can clone a node. It says I can get a particular node and then clone it. Clone node is true. I wonder what true is. 
Scroll down. Deep. Specifies whether all descendants of a node should be cloned. Well, yes. Because in this case, I want not just the, the email box uh, tag here. I want, like, everything inside of it. Now, one problem is that how am I going to clone it? Well, I need to look it up by ID, but we have a class name. We could also look it up by class name, but the problem is lots of things share this class name. So if we try and look it up, we could get false positives. So now we're going to have to give it a unique name. And I'll call it, you know, ID is um, email box template, like this. Okay, let's start there. This seems to maybe be going on the right track. We'll find out soon. Now I'd like to clone it. So now in my create email field, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to say document .get element by ID, uh, email box template dot clone node. Was it clone node? Yep. True. Now let's just console log that. Uh, let's store it in you know const new or new item equals that, and let's console log new item. Let's see what we get. You know, let's let's just Take it bit by bit. One, okay. All right, div email box, cool. Okay, I've actually got the elements here. Um, great, okay, now, what's the problem? There's a couple of problems here. One is it's still hidden. I don't want it to be hidden. Well, I, I do want it to be hidden at the moment, but you'll see if I try and add it now, like let's try and add it to our email box list like we did with the dummy one new item like this um, and we try that out let's see if it appears and it won't appear right because it's still hidden so even though I'm clicking that notice that button still disappeared after four clicks and that's because it's still actually working like if we look at the DOM and we look here you'll actually see that there's more email boxes being added it just happens that they're hidden so I need to remove the property to make it visible to do that, I could say new item dot style dot display equals block. Okay, so this will make it appear. Great, so now it appears. The problem we're going to run into here is that now we have many of these elements with the same ID though. See how this one has an ID of email box template? That's not good because then later when we try and copy it, instead of there just being one template, there's now going to be several and you aren't sure how a browser works, maybe it's going to copy the wrong box or the right box. So the right thing to do here is to also then say new item dot, I think it's just dot ID, is it? Set ID? I actually don't know how to change the ID. Is it just ID equals blank? I don't know. Let's try that out. I haven't done this in a while. Um, let's see if there's any ID here. Okay, got rid of the ID. That's good. We can actually peeky back on top of this, and now instead of having to manually make the element visible, we can actually just tie it being hidden to the ID itself, so that when we remove the ID, it's no longer hidden. So now the ID only, the display hidden only applies to that ID element. So now, e easier code, simpler code. Great. Okay, so we remove the ID, all is well, this appears, but the t it's the wrong text here, so we actually need to put the right text in. Because this one here says email2, and you know, it has email2 as the ID and stuff, so you know, we need to kind of clean that up. <clears throat> well, how can we deal with that? Oh, okay, well, we've got three places. Let's get rid of the, the four label, just because it doesn't, it's not going to change any of our learning tonight. Um, we've got two places. We've got email one here and we've got email there. Now anytime you want to do some modifications with JavaScript, it's usually a good idea to wrap what you want to modify in some kind of identifier. So for instance here, I might wrap this in a span with class name, um, like email number, for no other reason than so I can look it up. So that like what I can do now is I can go down into my template and I can put this here and make it blank. So now I'm going to actually specify that I want the inner, inner text of that email number to be something. So here we go. I say new item dot, is that find? I don't know, child, ch children. I, this one escapes me off the top of my head. 
Um, you know, so we've got our div, and then that's got a label which has a span inside of it. Let's just start console logging stuff, right? Um, I'm kind of used to jQuery. It's where I learned a lot of my DOM stuff was through jQuery, which has some easier functions. Um, so okay, let's console log it. Add more. Oh. Something broke. I don't think this is a function. There you go. I got my label. Okay. So ignore the two of these because we've called the function twice. So we've got a label, but then what happens if I want to get the children of... Well, okay, so when you get... The, the children property of a DOM element is a list. I know that there's only one child of my template. It's the label. So I'm going to get that label. This is now the label. There's the label. Inside of that, we have two children. Well, we have a few. We have some text, we have my span, we have some more text, and we have the input again. So, let's try and see what the children of my label are. This is going to give me another array. That array has two elements in it. It's actually skipped out on all the text because it's not interested in text. It's just giving me the HTML elements. And um, because of that, I'm going to get the, the one index element here, which is my, sorry, the zeroth, which is my email number. Right, and then I'm going to set its inner text to be, say, 3. Just to try it out. Great. Okay, that's working. That's what I want to happen here. Except I don't want it to be 3. I want it to be like 4 and 5 and whatever. So now I need a sense of awareness, right? So what I might do now is I set email field count to be 2. But what I might have to do is actually pass in, say email field count plus one here and email field count plus two here and then take that in as an argument so I might say you know count is in now an argument of my create email field and then here I'll say okay this should just be now count so we can generalize this now so you know three four five six seven eight nine ten I also need to set the ID of the field because if you remember these early email boxes actually have in them an input ID of say email one. So now I need to do a similar thing here and you know I'll say okay well I want my label and now I want the input and then I want the input ID to be equal to um, email one or, or, or whatever this is. It's like there you go. So now this should actually set the ID of the element in this case. So if I refresh this and now I inspect this particular input you see email 3, email 4, etc. Yeah. Now, I can take this even further and, and clean up my stuff even more by getting rid of these email boxes. I don't need them anymore. I've literally developed a, a totally, like a function driven process to generate these. So I'm just going to get rid of them. And what I'm going to do is when the page loads, I'm actually just going to create two of them straight away email field one and email field two. You know, and in fact, I don't even need to set this email field count at, at uh, two anymore. I can set it at zero because my functions are doing this. Actually, I can't do that. Sorry. Not, not quite that. I can't quite do that yet, but it's like... Oh, okay. So what I'm doing here is not going to work. Let's try and find a better approach here. We want to totally generalize this. So what I might do now is I might actually take this whole, f I might actually take this function, I might take this uh, code and abstract it into a function called say add two email fields or add more email fields. Because specifically it won't add, um, you know, it won't add two if it can't. And what this function will do is it will just do this. It will just, you know, check if this is less than eight and if it is, it will increase it. So now what we can do is we can actually set the email field count at zero at the start and then we're just going to call add more email fields at the you know the end of our code now obviously here we also have to call it inside of our click and see if this works nope didn't work what have we done wrong got an error cannot read properties of null reading clone node Hmm. Why is that clone node null now? That's weird, isn't it? 
I don't understand why it's null. Oh, I know why it's null. Oh, I, I ex oh, that was this was an accident, but this is a great lesson. Why is it null? It's actually really it's actually really obvious when you know what to look for. It says that I can't call a property on something that was clone noted, which is basically saying new item is not valid. If I printed that out, I'd get null or undefined. And it's, it's actually erroring on this line here because it's like, I can't find ID of null. Yeah, so Lil Nako has pointed it out, which is that I actually have my template under the script tag. So what's happening is when we get to this point in the code, all this JavaScript is running and it's all finishing before this DOM element is rendered. That's one of the other reasons we like to try and put, say, our scripts at the end, or at least have them run after the DOM is rendered, because now this will work for us. There you go. So that all works fine. So this is cool because now I've totally generalized my function and my HTML is even simpler. And this is actually how your assignment two is going to end up. You're going to have quite a lot of um, elements that you've created as templates and you'll be reproducing them and stuff like this. So, you know, it's kind of like you'll be building a lot of your stuff on the HTML page, but you'll be kind of generating it and putting it in the right spot with the JavaScript. Okay, um, now we've done that, great. Raymond says, could you do email field count plus plus in the create email field? Yeah, so look, what Raymond's here saying is like, you know, can, can you just do this? This would be a bit cleaner. Um, look, I, I get it. I, I think that's, I think that's fair. Sure. Yeah. Why not? Ah, ah. Sort of. I would have to change the count. Ah, yeah. I'd have to. Yes, you're right. I I just would have to change a couple things. Okay. Um, we're at seven thirty now. I'm conscious that a lot of the lectures we give you in this course are actually more than two hours for the pre-recorded. So, like, again, I, I actually don't want to get two hours on these live lectures. Um, so if you want, we can do another, well, would you like that we kind of quickly talk about the pop-up and the submit button, um, just very quickly, and then we wrap up? Would that be good, or do people want to wrap up uh, now? It's up to you. While people are answering that question, so... Um, Uh, Jahan Zeb says, I don't get how it ends up as email three in the text. Well, it ends up in email three because what happens is we, we create a copy of this div and we set the email number here to be three. And we set that email number to be three because when we call this function from the button, we call create email field and we pass in three because at this point email field count is two. Okay, so we'll do the submit and the pop-up. Kelvin says, are there any disadvantages of having elements as hidden? It's, it's, it's not really. I mean, browsers are pretty chunky beings. Um, the camera is like so so shiny on the bottle. Um, look, I mean, you'd have to have so much HTML for it to be slower. I wouldn't. I wouldn't worry at all. You know, that's that's unnecessary optimizations. Okay. Pop up. When someone clicks submit, I'm going to give that an ID of submit and we're just going to, we're just going to capture it, right? We're just going to say, you know, submit button, submit. We'll capture the click just like we have been these other things. Um, by the way, in terms of organizing this, you, you really probably should organize things a bit cleaner than me. Like typically what you might do here is maybe, you know, put all your variables up the top like this. Um, if I make this whole thing bigger, um, I would probably then put my functions above that, you know, and then I would put my um, listeners below that. So, you know, now I'll add another listener, which is like, you know, submit button dot add event listener. Click. Now, how do we, how do we, how do we give a pop up? Well, I mean, there's some built in pop ups for browsers that are really simple, you know, like you can, you can generate a confirm. Um, you can do this. Are you sure? And this will give you a really simple kind of vanilla pop-up. Are you sure? Okay. Or you can do an alert. Or you can do a submit. Oh, what is it? Um, prompt? I don't know what the other one is. Is it a prompt? 
Yeah. Or you can do a prompt where you actually get asked to like type in text. Yes. You know, there's a few different things you can do there, but they're all very basic. It's like you can alert, you can confirm yes or no, or you can confirm with a text input. I think they're the basic ones a browser can do. Um, CC's asked a good question though, just before we keep going. So let me console log click there. So we got that click for the button. Click, 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 click. Oh, this one's also submitting. So I need to put the prevent default here. Click, 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 click. Um, so CC's kind of saying like, okay, so you can either do a couple things. So you can either do that or you can um, create a function, call it dummy, and we'll just have it. All it's going to do is console log dummy. And then what you can do in theory is you can take this dummy function here and on the DOM, you could put on the submit button on click equals that. So there's some HTML attributes which actually take in, which actually run JavaScript like the on click here. And let's see if that works. Oh God. No, that doesn't work because the JavaScript needs to be loaded I think, ahead of that maybe. Oh, I can't remember. I don't do this much. Surely that's not the problem. Is that why it's failing? No, that's not why it's failing. Sorry, there's something else here. Uh, cannot read properties of null reading at event listener. Submit button is null. Oh, because I removed the ID because I'm a numpty. Sorry. Um, let's just get rid of these things for now. So like you can do this thing where you put um, you put like JavaScript commands inside the on clicks. I don't like it. I think it's ugly. I think it I think it's very hard to control. I think it I think it ties a bit too much uh, you know business logic into your HTML code, um, where your HTML code should be really focused on you know like structure, and you can keep your JavaScript code to focusing on you know how it works. So I'd, I'd probably be definitely inclined to not do that and just try and put as much as you can in the JavaScript. That's my opinion. I, I don't know if that makes it the course's opinion. I don't know if that's something. Sure, it's the course's opinion now, I guess. Um, so we do it this way because it, all our logic is just centered in the same file. Um, so our submit button has the click. How do we make a modal or a pop-up? Well, that's actually pretty easy to do in a, like, there's all these CSS libraries which are in other lectures and stuff, but if you were to just kind of MacGyver one yourself, there's a really easy way you can kind of go about this. At the top of your body, make a div, give it some styles like background, background blue, height 100%, width 100%, like this div, right? Now my whole page is filled with blue. Great. This is actually a div though that's filling up the whole page. It's actually filling up the whole, it's actually filling up the height of the window and then the page is being displayed under it. So height 100% here means 100% of the viewport. So then the page is being loaded underneath there. What I can do instead though, um, is I can now give it a position of fixed. So position of fixed means that it's like fixed in place on the screen and now everything else is kind of underneath this. So this is just always gonna be this size. Now, one thing that's being a bit weird here is the body margin around the outside. I'm going to get rid of that just because it, it makes the page look a little bit funny. So now we have like a full screen thing. And what happens if you don't want it to be full screen? What happens if you want it to be like, say, half screen and half width? I do that. And then what do we get? Well, we have a box here. Now, this box is going to stay there because it's position fixed. So it's always like fixed to the frame. Doesn't matter where the scroll's at. This position might be a little bit weird. So if you were to make a, a ghetto pop-up, um, what you might do, for instance, this is like how I might approach it, is I say I'm going to have a width and a height of 100%, take up the full screen. I'm going to do a background of white, except it's going to be trans half transparent. So RGBA means red, green, blue, alpha. Alpha is your like how transparent it is, and 0.5 means 50% transparent. So what this is going to do is now it's going to create this like white overlay. And in fact, I might want it to be like maybe a little bit less transparent. So it's only, it's 80% opaque now. It's 20% transparent. Now what I'm going to do is inside of that, I'm going to create another div that's kind of my actual pop-up. 
This might have a background of blue, it might have a width of 400 pixels, it might have a height of 50% say, and I might say pop up like this. Okay, now I've got a pop up. I don't like where it's positioned though. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set an automatic margin on the left and the right to move it into the right position. And I might also add a margin to the top. So I'll say margin top, 50 pixels, margin left, auto, margin right, auto, like that. Okay, now it's kind of in an okay spot. And this is cool because even if the page is, well, that's not super cool, but even if the page is really big now, it should hopefully fill the screen. Maybe instead of a width of 400 pixels, which you can see looks a little bit weird when the screen gets small, I might give it a width of say 80%, which is most of the screen. However, I'll give it also a maximum width of 400 pixels. So this will mean that it's 80% of the screen until it reaches 400, then it stops there and it doesn't get any bigger. And this will help us on the smaller screens as well. So you see it's always 80% of the screen until it gets to 400 and then it stops growing. Does it stop growing? Yeah, so it's like it's, it's 400 as the max, but if it gets less than that, it'll be 80%. You know, so now we've got this little pop-up and it doesn't matter how far we scroll on this page, the pop-up's still there. Now, again, many of you will start using component libraries, which we have lectures on. Um, though this is just this is kind of giving some background around how you might solve this problem, right? So Great, we have our pop-up um, Let's give it a more reasonable color like, you know, RGB, I don't know 200, 255, 200, that should be a, a very light green Very ugly light green Great, and there's our, oh, that's such a horrible color. Let's do like a light red or something That's very aggressive, maybe a light blue That's okay. Let's give this element some padding as well. We can move all of these into styles uh, later. Padding at 20 pixels. Okay, that made my pop-up a little bit bigger. It's okay. Um, and great, now how do I turn it on and off? Well, let's by default say, um, make it display none. So it's hidden. Now the pop-up's hidden. So all we have to do now is give our pop-up an ID. Let's just call it like, you know, my modal as an element and then when we click on this thing all we have to do is say well document dot get element by id my modal dot style dot display equals block or yeah block should be fine bam there's my pop-up how do i get rid of the pop-up well i can put a button in the pop-up at the bottom of it say button that will confirm or cancel something and I could give these both IDs like uh, you know what ID should I give them both be like one should be like uh, confirm pop-up and the other one can be you know like cancel pop-up so confirm pop-up and cancel pop-up now let's listen to those click events so we'll come down here and we'll say you know document dot get element by ID and naturally I might the code I'm writing here is not very uh, it's the toward the end of the lecture I'm just trying to get through it um, normally we'd clean this up and make it a bit more consistent, but you know, I'll say, uh, can, did I, what was it? Confirm button. You know, confirm button uh, is going to do some stuff and cancel buttons are going to do some stuff, but they're probably both going to remove the modal. So I will just put this in here. And in this case, I'll say, you know, display none. And this one here, I'll also say display none. So now it's like, okay, click up, cancel, can, oh. Confirm and cancel aren't closing the pop-up. That's not good. Confirm pop-up, cancel pop-up, button ID. Oh, didn't write it. It's confirm pop-up, not button. You also notice I, I need to, I should probably put it inside the blue part so it doesn't look weird because currently it looks a bit weird, right? Um, so you now the page, it's like submit, submit, Confirm, cancel, still doesn't get rid of it. I've got another mistake in my code. Confirm pop-up. Oh, I'm not even doing, yeah, I'm not making sense. Right, I'm tired, sorry. Um, <laughs> add event, I was confused, because here's the thing, I was I was looking at the previous like uh, chunks of code and I was like just kind of uh, writing them the same width. So, you know, if we add our event listener for click, this is what it should be, sorry. Um, for confirm pop-up and cancel pop-up, this means that when either of these are clicked, now the motor will be removed. Confirm, cancel. Great. Okay, so I've got that now. 
Now the last thing I'm going to do here is just actually display the email addresses entered into the forms. So when someone actually shows the modal, what are we going to put inside of it? Well, maybe I'll make a div here called, you know, e uh, you know, div ID equals email info and we'll make a blank and we'll just populate this with JavaScript. So when someone actually clicks on the um, submit button, let's actually populate it. Let's get the element we want to populate. We'll call it, um, you know, email info like that. And now let's populate it with stuff. Okay, what are we going to populate it with? Well, the emails. What are those emails? Well, where do we find them? Oh, this one might be hard. Um, okay, so we've got all these classes here. Now, one thing you can do is you don't have to do get element by ID in JavaScript. You can actually do get element by class or get elements by class because classes are plural. So when I go down here and you see I've got my, all right, well, I've got my email box. Let's actually get all of the email box elements. So I'm going to say const email box elements equals document dot get elements by class name. So this will get me an array of DOM elements as opposed to the get element by ID, which just gives me one. And now I can say, you know, for um, const box of email box elements, let's print them all out. Just have a look at them. A, B, C, D, F, submit. Okay, there's the two of them. They're printed out. You notice that it's also actually printing out the email box template. Oh well, we'll have to filter that one out too. In fact, you can get around this whole thing by um, don't even include the class on the template. Add the class when you create it. So when you actually create the the box template up here, uh, then set you know new item dot add. How do you add class? Is it append class? I can't remember. Is it add class? Oh, say I just the DOM or just HTML DOM add class. Class list. Thank you. Class list dot add. Let's add email box here. So this should solve our problem. We're actually adding the class only when it's created. So pop up. Okay, I get my two email boxes. Now we want to get the actual i uh, the actual values of those inputs. So I could say box dot children. I know that the second uh, child is the input, and then I could say dot value because the value is the actual um, the the value that's given that input. So I do this. I I now type in a b c d. If I click submit and I get an error, uh, cannot read properties of undefined. Well, okay, well, let's just print out what children one is because I probably made a mistake. They're both undefined. Okay, well, let's print out what box.children is. I just have the label. That's weird. Why do I not have the email input? That doesn't make any sense. Oh, it's inside the label, derp. Okay, so that's a simple mistake. Children one. Great, submit. Okay, now I've got my email. This is my input tags, and now I want the value like I did before. So now we can try this out. A, B, C, D, E, F, submit. A, B, C, D, E, F, great. Um, and then I can, if I want to, I could, you know, append, I don't know. Um, I could uh, append to the email info. I could append a freaking, um, I could make a new attribute if I wanted to, like single info equals document. The JavaScript, like manipulating the DOM like this is really uh, cumbersome, right? Like, okay, I'll create a new div and then I'll, I'll set the inner text, you know, to be this. And then I'll append single info like that. Okay, all all easy, all done. Uh, yep, okay, A, B, C, D, E, F. Beautiful, there it is. Add more, D, E, F, G, H, I, A, A, A. Uh-oh. 
So what's happening here is every time we're actually making that pop-up appear, we're actually adding more to it. That's easy to that's easy to sort out because you know you could just um you could just at the start of this one you could just clear the email info. You could just say email info dot inner I don't know remove. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how to remove all the attributes in one foul swoop. Um, HTML DOM remove children. I mean, you can do it with loops and stuff, but I don't know how to do it for all of them. Select the last child. Yeah, yeah. Repeat the first step. Okay. Well, here's here's the fun. Here's the last thing we'll do. Let's just write a really let's write a really cute um, thing then. So, like, if you actually have a look, there's if we console log email info dot child children you'll actually see that it's it's again it's a list right it'll be a list of items so um, you know we, we put ABC here DEF we click submit there's two items there so it's actually a list of items so to remove all those items normally you'd probably actually just delete the element and create it again or something um, though in this particular case you could actually say uh, you know for const child of the children and this is probably not even this probably won't even work email info dot remove child child you know it's pretty ugly to have to use a for loop to do that def def this isn't working why is this not working I, I'm sure it's to do with the whole mutating the array as you're working on a thing um so you know and there's like George has shared some stuff in the chat around removing elements um, you'd write it into a separate function but to be I mean to be honest you wouldn't normally do this what if, if you were to do this you would actually kind of um, you know maybe delete the whole email info element and recreate it and then append that or something you wouldn't go around deleting like tons of DOM elements that would just be very inefficient so anyway I think that brings us to the end of tonight um, I mean again I could I could talk about this for hours but let's just draw a line here and say okay that was good we got to explore a lot of DOM manipulation and pages um, the reason I like this is because now you kind of get what the next four weeks is three or four weeks the next three or four weeks is this plus some of the networks and promises stuff I will send out a notice on Friday with some updates though my, my advice again is please spend the time to watch some of our events, callbacks, promises and fetch just these like these particular lectures um, Simon, one of the tutors, has uh, actually made these new this term these are some of the new lectures this term we've tried to make some improvements on the previous term so hopefully they're good um, and we'll be talking about it a little bit next week anyway when we give an intro to assignment 2 so good luck with assignment 1 if you've already finished it, I'd recommend starting Assignment 2. It'll make your life easier. Um, have a great evening, and I'll see you all next week. Nice to see everyone again. Stay safe.